Welcome to Democracy Dialogues, a conversation we need to be having now about the state of democracy in the Americas. I'm Eric Farnsworth, your series host. Haiti is in crisis. Economic troubles, natural disasters, and political instability have left the nation one of the poorest and most violent in the world. So far in 2023 alone, gang violence has left more than 2,400 people dead. Violence and instability increased significantly after the assassination of President Jovenel Moïse in July 2021, contributing to a further breakdown of government control over much of the country. Turf wars among gangs have increased both internal and external refugees fleeing sexual violence, kidnappings, food shortages, and despair. The breakdown of rule of law can be seen in the targeting of police officers and other government officials. With no visible end to the violence and desperation, the situation risks spiraling into an even deeper humanitarian crisis. The international community is currently in talks to send a multinational force to Haiti, led by Kenya. What's come out of those meetings? Is this likely to move forward? How does the legitimacy, or lack thereof, of acting Prime Minister Ariel Henry affect what happens next? And what else can be done to address the Haitian crisis? To discuss these issues, we have one of the most knowledgeable and distinguished observers and reporters on Haiti and the Caribbean, Jacqueline Charles. Jacqueline is the Caribbean correspondent at the Miami Herald. Jacqueline, welcome to Democracy Dialogues. Thank you for having me, Eric. It's really great to be back with you. The situation in Haiti, as I've just mentioned, is increasingly desperate. Can things get worse? I think you actually answered that question in your introduction, um, spiraling violence. You know, the thing about Haiti is that those of us who think that things cannot get worse or that we've seen it all, something always happens like this recent, you know, massacre of worshipers um, who are participating in a march to, you know, into a territory controlled by a gang. So yes, things in Haiti can always get worse. What will it look like? What will the effect be? These are questions that keep many of us up at night, but the answers we also dread and hope that we never find out. Gangs reportedly control about 80% of the country. Some of your reporting is focused on this indeed. How did we get to that scenario and what can be done to get some of the gangs under control? Are they politically motivated? Are they criminally motivated? What's driving them and how can they be uh, limited in terms of their impact? You know, in recent days, I've been thinking a lot about that question in terms of how did we get here and, and how do you show that as a journalist, you know, to your readers who may not have been covering this country or following, you know, what's been happening. And I've been thinking a lot about Canaan, which is this post-earthquake settlement that was created after the catastrophic 2010 earthquake. Uh, I remember when I was in Haiti on that particular day, I was with Haitian President René Preval, and someone came up to him and said, okay, they're going to start moving the people off the Gulf course to Kana. This is when the actor Sean Penn was very involved in Haiti. Uh, we had a number of people, including um you know, from the U.S. Southern Command, General Kelly and others, you know, we're thinking about, about how do we move these people out? And while when you're looking at this current place in history with Haiti, you can go back 30 some years, I think you get a better sense of how did we get here if you go back to 2010. You think about that earthquake, 7.0, nearly destroyed Port-au-Prince. You think about 1.5 million people who were homeless, 316,000 killed, according to the Haitian government. But yet when we see U.S. figures, we will see figures like 40,000. And this Haitians don't know how many people were killed in their own country. And you remember the buildings that just completely caked. And then the push by the international community to, to move people out, to have that image, the optics, to show that we are doing something. And so you take this area like Kana, which was basically deserted. This is where you had mass graves during the dictatorship when they kill people. And there was a lot of pressure on Preval to provide land for housing. And he basically declared this area eminent domain. And then people started moving in before the government can do anything. So when you had the weakness of the state, the slow acting state, um, before it could get in, things started mushrooming. 
and people were moving into an area that had no infrastructure whatsoever. And then you still had a lot of aid groups that were there. So they were also this magnet that were coming in. Um, and then, you know, I started hearing about gangs, you know, armed groups inside. You were still able to go into kind of talk to people, but people were saying, be careful because there are these groups that are armed that are, you know, starting to create problems. And everybody was ignoring it. Everybody was ignoring it. And now here we are today. This place is a complete no-go zone. Um, there are over 300,000 people that live there that it's not yet its own county or city, but it's rivalry, rivaling some of you know the, 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 the larger cities. And you have this gang problem. And it's a gang problem that has spread throughout Port-au-Prince. So when I look at, I, I, I look at and I see there were decisions that were made or that were not taken. There were things that were ignored or they were very narrowly focused because it's not just about people taking up, up arms. When you look at the individuals who were involved, when you talk to them and you look at their socioeconomic conditions, you see that these are people who are living in slums or ghettos or they've been completely ignored by the society. And often when, when when strangers go to Haiti for the first time, they look at the wide disparity, inequality, and they say, well, how is it that the people at the bottom haven't risen up against the people at the top? And when you talk to people today, they will tell you that, you know, when you take back the violence and all of this, some people see this as the people at the bottom sort of rising against the people at the top, because now the gang problem is no longer just isolated into the slums, into certain communities, it is spread out and they are and they are everywhere. So when you hear this about 80 percent of Port-au-Prince, you know, some people tell you that it's more. And what I know is that the capital of Haiti today is a place after three o'clock, it shuts down. It's not that gangs don't kidnap people after three o'clock. They don't kill people. They don't carry out their violence. But people have no way to secure themselves. So they do what they can. And they try not to be on the streets when it turns dark. They try to just go where they need to go and go home. And hopefully that day, your neighborhood has not been taken over by one of these armed groups. What you're describing is essentially a failed state or at least a failing state. And the question then naturally arises, you know, if you bring in a thousand or two thousand international peacekeepers led by a country that's not even in the Western Hemisphere, Kenya, what conceivably, from a pragmatic perspective, could be done to bring some of this scenario under control or reassert the rule of law in a country where the rule of law seems not to exist? Well, let's let's take take this step by step. Today, you're looking at a numbers game, right? Um, when you're talking about security, you have a situation where you have a country of almost 12 million people. You have a police force on paper, somewhere between 13,000 and 14,000, but in reality, it's 3,300 police officers throughout the entire country on public safety duty on any given day. That is according to the United Nations. Now, me and my fellow journalists have been trying to find out from the Haitian National Police, and so we haven't been able to get the answers, of that 3,300, how many are actually in anti-gang operations? Mm, we we yeah. think we know the answer because we clearly see it. And it's not very many. You, you probably don't even have 1,000. You only have really four specialized units. And they cannot run two big gang operations at the same time. What has saved Haiti from having this spiral to get worse is the fact that you're seeing this community get hit, that community get hit, but you haven't seen everybody rise up at one time. And the police just would not be able to, to respond to this. You have units that have been going nonstop, individuals in those units who have been working anti-gang operations since the 29th of January. There's been no day off. There's been no respite. There's been nothing. And so when you, and then you think about the fact you have a police force that is ill-equipped, they don't have ammunition, they don't have guns. And today we had this little thing called the Biden Humanitarian Program. When you think about you've had dozens of police officers who have been killed at the hands of armed gangs. And when I talk to supervisors, they say, you tell an officer to do this, they tell you, well, I'm not risking my life because I'm waiting for my email, you know, from the US that says that I can, you know, that I can migrate. Mm. So you have all of these challenges today. And how are you supposed to deal with the reality of armed groups that are taking control of a capital. So first and foremost, you have to find a way to address the security. But it's not a panacea. It's not 
you know, all of a sudden this is going to take care of all of Haiti problems. When you talk to people who are involved in the Brazilian-led mission of the United Nations, MINUSTA, despite the criticism, MINUSTA did a lot of positive things. And, and probably the reason why we're seeing a lot of what's happening now is because they were so good at, you know, being very proactive on those and not allowing it to get to this point. But it has to be a holistic approach because you have to deal with what's happening in these communities that are encouraging young people to go into gangs. And they think that that's the only thing available because a gang leader dies today, but there are 10 young kid people behind him that are ready, that are ready to take over, you know, so you have to also address, as you mentioned, the humanitarian crisis, you know, hungry people cannot vote. You know, you also have to address the issue of democracy. You know, Haiti was a country that was under nearly 30 years of the Duvalier dictatorship, and then it fell. And then all of a sudden people said, hey, you can go vote. You're a democratic. But there was no lesson that was, you know, taught and says, here's what the power of your vote means. And when you look at the elections that have taken place in Haiti in the last decades, which you see less and less people that are going to vote because less and less of them believe in this thing we call democracy. And what they've seen is we have not moved forward in the last, you know, 30, 40 years. We've actually moved backwards. So, so it has to be not just whether it's Kenya or someone else that comes in, but there has to be a commitment on a part of the international community to change the way that it does business. You can't just sit around the table and talk about, you know, here's what we're going to do for Haiti. And then you look around the room and all of the NGOs, the nonprofits, they're all foreign entities and they're not Haitians. They're not people on the ground because you have some rule that says that you're not going to provide direct funding, you know, to those individuals. I have been throughout Haiti. I've been in parts where they haven't seen a white person. They haven't seen um, a embassy staffer in the last two or three years. And there's a lot of tension. There's a lot of resentment. And I remember a time, you know, just into like 2008, 2010, when Haitians sort of recognized that their government was not going to be the one that's going to save them. They were looking to the U.S. to come and save the day. And today that is not the case. So how do you build that back? To build back that trust in order for you to go in and for you to try and make a difference. Because the reality is, is that there's a fallout. When people feel like they cannot live and they feel that there's no hope and they feel that they have no security, they take chances. They get on boats and they try to get to the shores of Florida or they try to get to Puerto Rico. Or what we're starting to see people come in through the southern border. Yeah, and you very effectively linked the violence uh, scenario with the political scenario. So let's go there. Uh, some people have suggested that you really can't resolve some of the problems of gang violence and just generalized violence, et cetera, without some sort of political accord uh, at the national level. Tell us what are the most promising uh, activities that uh, might be leading to a political accord? So um, today we are more than two years since the assassination of the patient president of Namuiz. Yep. Um, during the time that he was in office, he had not held one election. There was no election. Uh, he was also a very controversial figure. You know, we didn't get to this gang violence overnight. There were, you know, we, we started to see the deterioration um, with, with the gangs, the proliferation you know, of the gangs. I think having someone elected, you know, they were able to do a little bit more than you had civil society and human rights groups saying this country can't go to, you know, elections and they didn't want to go to elections, you know, which of them was because it was an issue of a lack of trust. Uh, fast forward today, uh, his murder remains unsolved. And today you have no elected individuals in the country. Um, that means no parliament, none of your mayors, um, no one. And even when you look at the Haitian constitution, um, you don't even have a constitutional court to address constitutional issues, the, the constitutional crisis that we're currently in. We also have, as you mentioned, that the president of the Supreme Court died of COVID right before um, Moises' assassination. So this was really like the worst case scenario from a, a governance standpoint um, that happened in Haiti. And you have an acting prime minister, um, Ariel Henry, who was there. He was Jovenel's seventh prime minister. And I think of the seventh, only one was actually, one or two were, were approved by parliament and the others were in the same situation as Henri in terms of not having the blessing of parliament to govern. But you have civil society, and that's what the Montana group is. The Montana group is a group of, you know, individuals from civil society, human rights groups that are saying enough already. This country has been poorly governed. Um, it has not worked. And we need to put the brakes. And we need to come together and we need to have a transition. 
and we need to take the country forward. And you've heard a lot in terms of this Haitian-led solution um, to the crisis. Some people will tell you that in some ways it's been oversimplified, the idea of um you know, political groups controlling these gangs. So if you get a political accord, you know, everything will calm down and, 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 and things will be better. Others will argue to you that these gangs are increasingly autonomous. And while they may have some political connections, that's not pulling their strings today. So even if you have some sort of political agreement tomorrow, you know, without institutions, strong institutions in place, um, without other, you know, stop gates that, that are needed, you're not really going to ameliorate the situation. All you're going to do is to be able to give the international community to say, OK, we've got a political agreement and we can move forward by having some outside you know, intervention. Yeah. So far, they have not been able to come together, neither the Montana group and um, the UNRI government on a vision for governance. How do you govern a country when there's no president, there are no elected leaders? What is the way forward? And from the international, especially the U.S. standpoint, it's like, look, they want elections. I mean, I think that's where this is going. And Haiti has something called a CEP, a Provisional Electoral Council. It's always controversial. It's supposed to be representative of certain you know, groups in society. And so if you can get a political accord and you can get people to be in agreement, then you can get people to nominate individuals to a provisional council, and then you can start to work on the elections. But as long as you can have two sides keep fighting and bickering and this logjam, then there's always going to be this question of legitimacy in terms of any sort of vote and how you're going to get there. So I think that that's sort of the root of it. Look, today, you know, what happens next in Haiti really is in the hands of Haitians. But if Haitians are not able to come around, come to the table around some core issues, um, you know, I don't see how we move from that. And, and there's disagreements in terms of, you know, not just the way forward, but whether or not there should be a foreign intervention or not. Um, when you talk to individuals at the Montana court, they say that we can do it. So you say, okay, what's the solution? How do you do it? It goes, it goes silent. You have a government that has just basically been quiet and silent on things. And people are saying, do you even care about me? Do you care, you know, what's happening? Um, and, and so at the meantime, in the middle are 12 million people that are trapped. You know, they're, they're, they're looking for some sort of a salvation. They want to be able to just breathe because they don't know if they're going to be next. And that's the tragedy in this crisis is that, you know, every week there's a new neighborhood that's under attack and you hear of a new block that has fallen under gang control. And once those blocks fall under gang control, you don't see them Take, you don't see them taking back. You don't see the numbers decreasing. You see the numbers spreading. So, so that's where we are right now. This is a political logjam between these, you know, these two groups. You know, those who support Henri, the acting prime minister, those who support the Montana, um, you know, who want, you know, a a, a, a transition. Um, they they've had this very expansion, expanded view in terms of, you know, how many people would be involved. Um, here's with the governance. But, you know, what's interesting in all of this, and people are probably upset, but we haven't heard the word protectorate. You know, everybody, I remember a few years ago when that word came out, and Don Boney, my, my predecessor, God bless him, and he wrote a column about whether Haiti should be a protectorate. And people were up in arms. And today, though, it feels like everybody's sort of dancing around it, looking for everything. But, you know, we're at a situation where this country is dealing with some unprecedented issues. Um, but the one issue that continues to haunt Haiti is the dysfunctional politics. Yeah, absolutely. We're here in Democracy Dialogues with Jacqueline Charles, who is the Caribbean correspondent for the Miami Herald, one of the most distinguished and awarded correspondents who's won an Emmy Award and shared a Pulitzer Prize and numerous other awards to her name and her very impressive background and resume. Jackie, let's continue with that conversation in terms of the uh, political dysfunction in the country, because if the U.S. and other countries are pushing for elections, but we've also talked about the deep insecurity in the country, not just in Port-au-Prince, but throughout the country, how do you run free and fair elections just as a pragmatic issue to even get to the point where a leader or leaders can be 
uh, determined by the people to be, you know, in control of the country. And when you put on top of that what you've just said, which is to say there aren't any, let me reemphasize that, any elected leaders right now in Haiti, I mean, how do you not just run elections, but how do you have electoral legitimacy based on the outcome? I mean, these are some pretty huge questions that have to be addressed. Exactly. And what I find is that no one's really discussing this in, in Haiti society because this is where this hope seems to be headed, right? I mean, we went through a period before the president was assassinated where we heard elections, 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 and then he was killed. And then you did not hear the word elections out of the international community. But in Increasingly now, with every UN Security Council meeting on the situation in Haiti, somebody inevitably drops the word elections when security conditions permit. And I think that this is why you're seeing this push. Um, There's a reality on the ground. Yes, right. When this was when the request was made in October for a multinational force, you had a powerful gang controlling the country's fuel terminal. Um, we had a cholera outbreak. You know, there was truly already a humanitarian crisis, which was worsening. Hospitals were closing their doors. Schools and businesses were closing. Um, but at the same time, you have people in you know decision making circles and saying, "Okay, how long has it been now? Okay, we need to get to elections." But they recognize that you cannot get elections if you don't address the issue with the security. So I think I would venture to say this is why you see that there's a push to get an assistant to the Haitian National Police. And we can talk about that later, but 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 that is the the the, the tricky thing here, right? They the, you, you hear from the US and others, we don't and from the Haitians especially, we don't want somebody to come in and bigfoot the, the Haitian National Police and do the job for them and put them aside. We want you know someone to come in and to assist them. And the question before the US, before Kenya, before um the UN is is how do you get that assistance where it feels like it's an it's an equal sharing as opposed to one replacing the other. Um, and, and, and that is what they're wrestling with right now. And I think the devil will be the devil's in the details, as, as we like to say on, on, on that eventually. But yes, how do you get to elections when today you have a capital that is controlled by gangs um, and and the elections is playing in the background? You know, let me just say, you know, human rights groups in Haiti um, as far back as probably what 2019 or maybe before, um, we're sounding the alarm in terms of the armed groups. You know why UN groups were saying, "Oh, this is a fight for territory." You know, to do extortion, to get money, tax base. Human rights groups in Haiti were saying, "No, no, no, no. This has to do with the elections." Like the, you know, people are trying to control voter constituencies, and um, and and they weren't listened to. And then as we've gotten one massacre after the other and the situation has worsened, now I would say that there is a recognition on a part of it that, you know, history repeating itself. Whenever you start to talk about elections in Haiti, you see an increase, you know, in the violence. Um, and, you, and you see this competition that's, good, that's, that's, that's going on. So, you know, imagine if the elections are called tomorrow, what, what is it going to look like? And you can't address that with 3,300 cops. Absolutely. And I think you've hit on the key point. We're all in some level captured by our own history. Obviously, there's a, a long history of international uh, activities in, uh, in Haiti, interventions, uh, goodwill gestures that haven't turned out right, sometimes bad will gestures, but uh, there's a lot in history there from any number of different countries. And I think you've quite accurately hit on the key point, which is to say, you know, if you're trying to stand up an effective police force, can you do it as a partner or do you have to do it as kind of an overseer? And that that's a real problem, isn't it? Because, you know, if you're dealing with taxpayer dollars and democracies and things like this, how do you put together a program of support as equals for a local police force that clearly has proven to be inadequate? The point that you're making, I think, is so important. And I just wanted to emphasize that. Is there a path forward? I mean, you know, it's a long term thing, of course, uh, in terms of training the local police force and creating effectiveness and all that thing. But, you know, presumably we've known about that for years. Why is that effort just beginning now? Well, I think, that, you know, one of the themes that I keep um, finding in the years that I report on Haiti is the lack of consistency, right? So what may be a priority for one administration or one ambassador or embassy or group of individuals, then it doesn't become a priority for, for, for the next. 
And, you know, today, you know, one thing that everybody says to me is the Haitian National Police are very well trained. Whenever trainers have gone down there, they're very impressed by, by these guys. But how do you expect for someone to go out and fight against gangs when their own home has or neighborhood has been overtaken by gangs? Yep. Or when they don't get paid on time or paid at all, or when they don't have adequate, you know, equipment. You know, I myself have uh, police officers in my family um, that have left the force, mm -hmm. not because they decided that they wanted to, but the circumstances pushed them to, to, to leave. And it wasn't, you know, I almost got killed yesterday, but it was something as simple as, they got injured and then you, you get a hospital bill that you can't even pay. You say, well, what is this when I have when I have insurance? Yep. Earlier this year, I was with um, Todd Robinson from INL and we literally landed in Haiti in the middle of a police riot. And the next day, you know, he went to to the training where the U.S. has been, you know, training a new SWAT. The stories that he heard um, was the fact that, you know, this guy here, he has to sleep here because um the gangs burn down his house this this one here can't even get home because he has to go through several neighborhoods that are controlled by gangs i, I think that's what people have sort of been missing about the situation it's easy to see there's a gang and then there's the police but there's a human reality you know in all of this in terms of what people are being asked to do um under the circumstances and and so I think that has to be part of the conversation moving forward. Okay, you bring in whomever, okay, and they leave. But does your force is is that force now strengthened? Are they in a better position? Um, are they are they vetted? You know, that's something that has that that we started and then it and then it sort of disappeared. Um, where there was no vetting. And so you started hearing reports about individuals who were being allowed into the police force and they didn't qualify. And the individuals who were supposed to be the watchdogs on that, they just turned, you know, the other way. I always say that you, you see a strong arm and then you see a hand uh, a hands off. And it often feels like the international community is always sort of a day late, dollar short, like when they should be strong arming, <laughs> they end their hands off and their hands off. They should, you know, So I, I think that that's what they have to figure out, that they have to be more astute into to, to what's happening and then looking and seeing where are areas that we can actually have impact. And then you turn it over to the Haitians so that they build on the foundation that is there so that when the next crisis comes comes along, there's a buffer. You know, you're not starting from, from a negative. Yeah. And your point about the human element is so true. We've seen that all over Latin America and the Caribbean. We've seen it in Central America. We've seen it uh, in countries larger and smaller than Haiti. But you're absolutely right. At the end of the day, police are humans and they react to the same issues that everybody else does. Uh, regrettably, our time is uh, getting to be expired, but Jacqueline Charles, I really want to thank you for sharing your wisdom with us, sharing your expertise. Uh, we've talked about a lot of things, but we haven't, in my, in my view, uh, really even done more than scratch the surface. And I hope you'll come back to really give us an even greater sense uh, of, uh, of Haiti as the situation continues and certainly, hopefully, uh, with a better, uh, more optimistic scenario uh, next time, uh, depending on what happens on the ground in Haiti itself. Thank you for having me. It's been a real delight. And to all of our viewers here at the Democracy Dialogues, where we explore the most pressing issues of democracy in the Americas. Find us on YouTube at the beginning of each month or watch past episodes at as-coa.org slash democracy dialogues. Until then, let's continue to work together to ensure that democracy delivers for all of us. Thank <music> you.